welcome to Mormons, Mystics, and Muons. Uh, today I've got uh, Bernardo Castropon. Thanks, Bernardo, for agreeing to come on. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so this is the first time we've uh, talked, and you know, I've, I've followed some of your things, followed the Essentia Foundation, and really, I, I came to a pretty similar. Um, model of reality, both on dissociative identity disorder, so dissociation, as well as um, kind of these stacked dreams, sort of the Tibetan Buddhist slash inception version of dreams. Um, so it was interesting to uh, come across, I think, your interview with ZDog MD, I think was the one that I first listened to. And it was, yeah, I was like, how oh, they somebody articulating it even better than I had kind of conceptualized it. So, um, so yeah, I've followed some of your work, but haven't read any of your books yet. So I'll give you, um, just a bit, I guess, to introduce yourself, kind of your background, uh, and then kind of go from there. Just, just a quick observation. The essay you wrote last year for the Essentia Foundation was our most popular essay of the year. Uh, we only got more attention for videos, but none of our essays uh, got more attention than the one you wrote about entropy and the rel rel relativity aspect of entropy, so to say. Mm -hmm. Entropy is in the eyes of the beholder. Um, my background, originally, I'm a computer engineer slash computer scientist. I, I, my master's was in computer engineering. My PhD was sort of between computer engineering and computer science. Um, and I'm also a philosopher. I also have a doctorate in philosophy. And uh, I'm best known these days uh, as a philosopher. I left the high tech world uh, a couple of years ago in the beginning of the pandemic to set up Essential Foundation and uh, one of the best decisions of my life, if not the best. And uh, so now my life is mostly philosophy. I do engineering as a hobby on the side. I am an active member of the open hardware community. So you can find some of my computers being sold by companies uh, out there. Uh, but I'm mostly a philosopher who writes about philosophy of mind and ontology, the nature of reality, the nature of the mind, and the nature of the self, and so on. Thanks. Yeah. I um, so I've my I'm a dentist, um, but my undergrad degree was in bioinformatics with a minor in computer science, and so I it's been interesting to see you, uh, Michael Levin, I think has a similar kind of computational background. I forget what his um, original degree is in, but certainly Stephen Wolfram, the computational approach to things and particularly blending that with psychology and biology um, and, and physics seems to be the most fruitful, I think. Um, and so at least for the people that I'm, I've been listening to and um, I guess consuming the most, that seems to be the common denominator. It's, it's definitely helpful, not only in our day and age because of AI and you know, all these popular uh, topics of discussion in the culture, which have a lot to do with computers and, and programming and so on, but a background in computer science and computer engineering um, forces you to understand very well what it means for a phenomenon to be purely mechanical. Uh, and if you understand that thoroughly, then you're also able to recognize what cannot possibly be purely mechanical. <laughs> and uh, which brings us to mind, biology, life, you know, the organism aspect of reality as opposed to the purely mechanical aspect of reality. So maybe that has something to do with the fact that a lot of us talking about these things have at least a minor background in computer sciences in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the same time, and maybe we'll get to this. Um, I think I've listened to you talk a bit about like the distinction between like a biological um, and like metabolism being something dif that differentiates, you know, like human consciousness from AI. Um, I I'm a little more on the other side of the spectrum that I, I uh, reading Stephen Wolfram's work, and I'm not sure how much you've gotten into that. Um, but, and knowing, you know, learning a little bit about large language models, to me, it's interesting to see, or even like Michael Levin, I was listening to a podcast uh, that he was on the other day talking about how 
you know, one perspective of things is simplifying everything to these very small, um, low level, subtle mechanical or computational rules. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't necessarily rule out, uh, these emergent or, you know, emergent, these complex experiences that we're having. Um, so I think that's, it's interesting, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about, oh, well, yeah, large language models. This isn't consciousness because we know exactly what it's doing. It's just predicting, um, you know, it's being trained on a data set and then it's predicting things from it. And then from a neuroscientific perspective, it's well, like, that's essentially what our, you know, these predictive uh, algorithms or, or models for brain cognition, it's pretty similar. And so I guess that that is an interesting question is, you know, what is, where is the difference between mechanical and kind of a rule-based um, system versus how our cognition, if you're looking at it from a more materialistic perspective, um, you know, where I think that, that difference is? I think there are a few distinctions we have to make. Um, one is um, consciousness is not a behavior. It has a behavior, but it is not a behavior. Um, Skinner and the behaviorists in the 1960s made this uh, abysmal statement that there is nothing to consciousness but what it does, which is obviously false. Even if I am lying down with my eyes closed and hardly breathing, I, I know my consciousness is still there, even though I'm not behaving, I'm not doing anything. So today in, in analytic philosophy and philosophy of mind, nobody makes this conflation anymore. We know that phenomenal consciousness is, is um, a metaphysical thing you know it, it, it's a question of being what is consciousness and that it behaves in certain ways yeah okay of course that we have to grant that but the the behavior of consciousness that not does not define consciousness what defines phenomenal consciousness is what it is like to be a conscious mm -hmm. something a conscious agent so it, it, it came to the point where almost now take the statement what it is like to be we take it for a noun uh, we say consciousness is the what it is like to beingness <laughs> of something. So we shouldn't conflate behavior with consciousness. Consciousness uh, has intrinsic properties of being uh, independent of their behavior. Uh, another conflation that we have to avoid is to is to think that although complexity, complexity science has uh, demonstrated beyond any doubt that simple rules can lead to very complex behaviors, and we have every reason to believe that um, the universe is re reducible, the universe can be reduced to simple rules. In other words, the, the, this enormous variety and, and complexity of things we see around us can be the expression of some very, very simple laws, some very, very simple regularities. This must be granted because the, the, the weight of evidence in favor of this conclusion is, is just overwhelming. But we cannot conflate simple rules with local rules. Um, in cellular automata, which is what Stephen Wolfram has been working with for, for decades now, the rules are local cells uh, only interact with their neighbors and their behavior is determined by the current state of themselves and their immediate neighbors. Um, in physics, um, most of the regularities of nature we have found are local, but that's a methodological bias. Um, physics requires us, when we are studying nature experimentally, physics requires us to control the experimental conditions to control all the variables that may have an influence on the experimental outcome. And to do that, the experiments have to be small. They have to fit into a laboratory setting. But there is nothing a priori etched in stone in nature declaring that all organizing principles in nature are local. You could have organizing principles that only kick in when the number of variables and the way they are distributed in space is enormous. In other words, there can be organizing principles that only kick in at the level of an entire organism or an entire society or an entire galaxy. And we, we are blind to those because 
we cannot control and isolate the experimental conditions. That stuff wouldn't fit in a lab. So we have this methodological bias towards thinking that all the simple rules should be local rules operating at small distances. And the only instance in which nature seems to violate that completely is uh, quantum entanglement, in which the experiments can still be small uh, in laboratory settings, um, but they can be linked by fiber optics such that entanglement is verified over a distance of many kilometers. Clearly, something there is not local. Nature may not be, you know, like a, a spatial temporal canvas in which you put things. Even that spatial temporal canvas may be just an artifact of our primate cognition and may not have an independent, standalone reality as a sort of objective scaffolding of the world. So I would agree that um, reductionism has a tremendous weight of evidence uh, for it. Um, but I would not necessarily agree that uh, all the organizing principles are local. I would also mm -hmm. not agree that consciousness is a matter of behavior. We, we've abandoned that uh, since, I don't know, the the 70s or the 80s uh, at best when we were talking about the explanatory gap when um, that famous paper was published what is it like to be a bat uh, which tried to emphasize precisely the beingness of consciousness as opposed to how it behaves and the statement what is it like to be came into into our lexicon in philosophy hmm. yeah uh, i haven't read that paper but yeah that's definitely it's it is interesting. I mean, you get so sucked into our perspective as well, I saw something on Facebook, uh, the other day that was, um, oh, it was, it was talking about, you know, if you can compress the 4.5 billion years of the earth's existence into a 24 hour day, uh, you know, al or, um, aliens, no, uh, dinosaurs show up mm -hmm. at like, you know, 10 30 PM or something. And then they leave at, you know, 11, 40 something, and then humans, uh, show up at, um, you know, I think it's a few minutes to midnight or whatnot. And then the recorded history is like the last couple. Um, and so it just looking at that, it is, it is pretty absurd to think that we somehow, if you're looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, somehow all of a sudden in the last minute of, of the recorded history that we have, evolved to some state at which our sensory and cognition um, is at the point where we can get to the fundamental reality and figure everything out and that we're seeing a veridical um, model of everything and that we'll be able to figure things out. So, so yeah, getting into realizing oh, bats construct a whole different world based on their sensory input um, as well as insects and, you know, their uh, ability to sense electromagnetic, different um, areas of the electromagnetic spectrum, it does humble you a bit and realize, oh, what I am seeing, the models that I'm making are purely based off of the information that I, that I have. Yes, and we, we sort of, uh, we, we are a unique example in the history of life because we've evolved enough and fast enough to espouse the illusion that we've cracked the mystery, that we know what's going on. But we didn't evolve anywhere nearly enough to actually know what's going on. <laughs> so we now live in this deluded idea that, um, and we have been living in this deluded idea at least since the turn of the last century. In 19, I think 1900, Lord Kelvin said, uh, we've figured it, everything out. It's a matter of increasing the precision and filling in the details now. And then came Einstein in 1905 and showed, well, you thought you understood something. You understood nothing. Everything is not as you thought it was. And of course, by now, we are discarding even Einstein. Uh, loop quantum gravity is getting rid of this notion of the fabric of space-time as an objective entity out there in nature. So we, we, we are constantly deluding ourselves that we figured it out. We are the only species on the planet um, that is not living immersed and bathed in the mystery. In reality, we are, but we think we are not. And we live according, according to, to, to this illusion. Um, 
some of it has to do with what happened um, following the Enlightenment um, in the late 17th, early 18th century. By the time the Enlightenment evolved enough around the middle of the 19th century to, to completely get rid of the clergy as intellectual authorities in society, and they were replaced by the bourgeoisie intellectual elite, you know, like Darwin, even Goethe, who was ennobled, but in fact he was born a bourgeoisie, son of a lawyer. Um, when that happened, we lost contact uh, with the mystery because the contact with mystery was codified in religion and we got rid of religion you know, at the level of the intellectual elites of our society. And that opened an enormous psychological gap in us um, because if you, don't have a con if you don't have any contact with the mystery, you lose a source of meaning because one of life's greatest meanings is exactly this notion that we are swimming in the mystery and we have a role to play in figuring it out. So the moment you get rid of that, because you got rid of religion and because you entertain the fantasy that we figured out nature, you lose that source of meaning. And psychologically, you undergo what psychologists call fluid compensation. We are meaning-seeking animals. We will always, if we lose one source of meaning, we will compensate by another. And another source of meaning that is very well known is closure. And so that reinforced the entire mechanism. In order to have meaning, we have to delude ourselves that we figured out what's going on, that we have closure. This is similar to, say, a family that loses a loved one in war abroad. They need closure in the sense they need their body back. They need mm -hmm. to know how the person died. They need a burial and the rituals. That's closure. It gives us comfort. And there are many forms of closure, one of which is this notion that although we are puny little primates um, and nature is much more powerful than us, we can get one up on nature by figuring it out. And, and so we are, we are, we are, our lives uh, is, are much more about psychology than we think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to, wanted to try to quickly run through what I think some important groundwork and then hopefully get into some uh, more in-depth stuff. I think in my, both my kind of religious journey, I, I was raised Mormon, left about seven years ago, kind of float around in ag agnosticism and um, until having essentially a ego death in my life of like divorce, moving cross country, getting into my own you know, therapy, psychology, um, life meditation. is very good at this. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, people talk about deconstructing religion, deconstructing Mormonism, but really like the deconstruction process has to go all the way to, to the roots, to, to language, um, and just try to figure out what the nature of truth is, uh, and, so a couple quotes, one by George Box, you know, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, and then exactly. another one from Sapiens, you know, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, he says in 1622 or 1620, Francis Bacon published a scientific mani manifesto uh, titled The New Instrument in which he argued that knowledge is power. The real test of knowledge is not whether it is true, but whether it it empowers us. Scientists usually assume that no theory is 100% correct. Consequently, truth is a poor test for knowledge. The real test is utility, a theory that enables us to do new things constitutes knowledge. Um, and I think, you know, science is a little better at this than, than I think religion, um, but really to continually progress, you have to understand that the idea of truth, I mean, there is no inherent meaning of the idea of truth. It's, it's really only, is the model, does it have utility? Is it internally consistent? Does it allow you to predict um, things? And then as soon as you get more input data um, that doesn't fall within that model, you need to have non-attachment to that model. You need to understand that it never was truth itself. It was just a, a model that you fit over the data that helped you predict it. And so you don't, you're not um, attached to that model, whether it's your religion or whether it's materialism. And so you can see, see the utility of it, 
um, and then update it uh, with another one. And and also I, I liked, um, I forget what podcast you were on, but you did a, a beautiful job of just explaining kind of the absurdity of the meaning making in, in and reductionism in the sense that, you know, anything you explain, you have to explain within, with terms, you know, with other terms, you know, you explain matter in, ter in terms of atoms, you explain atoms in terms of neutrons and protons and electrons, you explain them in terms of something else. Um, and this idea that you'll get to some, some, some fundamental truth is absurd because if you think about, it, if you take a step back from that pursuit, like, where do you think you'll ever end up? You, you'll never end up at a place that is indivisible and true because wherever you end up has to be a place you have to use terms that you yourself have defined. Um, there's, there's not going to be anything beyond what you've artificially created that you only has meaning in as much as you and give it meaning and other people agree on that same meaning. Um, so there is, it's useful, but there is some futility in this continual pursuit of dividing things. On the other hand, I think the other way of describing things is realizing that futility. And then yeah, I think this is what Jesus did in his parables, um, using this hermetic principle, like the law of correspondence as above, so below is that like, well, we're not going to get anywhere if we just keep dividing things smaller, but these allegories or these similarities, these algorithmic principles that, you know, just like, uh, you describe something in its relationship with other things in terms of some other principle that you see. Um, and that's one way it seems to get around this idea of, um, yeah, this, this feudal pursuit. And I think that's what you do with dreams and reality and dissociative identity disorder. And what we're experiencing now is, you know, let's use the model of dreaming and what happens when we are dreaming to help understand reality. And it's not that we're experiencing a dream right now, but we can use those same principles and something that we've understand a bit easier through psychology, um, and see if those same principles uh, apply now. So I, th I think it's an interesting interplay between that kind of reductionism versus focusing on the relationships that things have with it, with other things. And I think that's, that's an interesting, as I've thought about like information and even large language models and how it can translate between different languages. Um, it's finding that it's really the relationships of concepts with other concepts. Um, in this self-defined set of constructs that, that hold the meaning. It's the relationships of things to other things. Uh, I am not a metaphysical relativist. I don't think that reality is what we make of it or reality is purely a projection of our cognitive system. I, I think there are ultimate truths or at least one ultimate truth which grounds the meaning of everything. Um, because we define ultimate truth as the sum total of what is the case. Something must be the case. Even if reality, is, as we experience it, is a, is a superset of illusions, then, then that's the truth. <laughs> reality is a superset of illusions. And the ontological primitive, that irreducible thing, is that which is having the illusion. Or that which grounds everything that is having the illusion. There has to be something to ground meaning at the end of a chain of reduction. Um, we cannot explain one thing in terms of another forever without circularity. At, at the end, you explain the very last thing in terms of what you started with. In other words, mm -hmm. you got nowhere. You're just trying to chase your tail at a, a, long, a, a light speed like a dog. Uh, so I think that that's not the case. You, you, you can reduce one thing to another and that to yet another, but then you, you hit rock bottom at some point. At some point, there is something, some entity in nature that just is and cannot be explained in terms of anything else. Every metaphysics will have this ontological primitive, one or more. Physicalism, correctly interpreted, has uh, 18 of these ontological primitives, uh, 17 quantum fields plus gravity. Um, they are trying to reduce it to one. 
and there's good reason they might get there, but then they cannot reduce consciousness to that, which is the problem of physicalism. Um, panpsychism is more naive. It thinks that every elementary subatomic particle, of which there are countless gazillions in the universe, every one of them is an ontological primitive. That's very naive. It contradicts physics. With quantum field theory, we have abandoned this notion of particles as little marbles since at least the 1940s, arguably since 1929, when the idea first came up. So uh, uh, I am not a metaphysical relativist. That's where I parted ways, ways with Carl, Carlo Rovelli, because although I agree with relational quantum mechanics, which was proposed by Carlo, uh, which says that every physical entity is in fact a relation and not an absolute, I agree with that. Every physical entity is the outcome of a measurement. In other words, it's a relation between the measurer and that which is measured. The outcome of that relation is a measurement, and, and physical entities are the outcomes of measurement. That's what quantum theory and quantum experimentation tell us, the experiments that won the Nobel Prize in 2022, only less than two years ago. Um, but Carlo then says, well, every physical entity is relational, and there is nothing but physical entities. Well, that gets you into infinite regress immediately. Let, let's take something that we all understand is a relation, movement. Movement is relational. If you are inside the train, in relation to you, the train is not moving, even if it's going at 300 kilometers an hour, like the TGV. But if you are standing on a rail, rail station platform and the train passes by, then in relation to the platform, the train is moving. But in relation to the passenger inside the train, the train is not moving. So movement is always a relation. What Carlo then says is that because there are only physical entities and physical entities are relational, what he's saying is that there is movement, but there is nothing that moves. In other words, the very concept of movement loses its meaning. It means nothing because movement only has meaning insofar as there are at least two things moving with respect to one another. But Carlo says these two things are themselves movements. But movements of what? Well, of more movements. So it's movements of movements of movements. So it's turtles all the way down. And I don't think this has any meaning. Carlo appeals to some vague writings by a Buddhist monk of what was the third century or uh, Nagarjuna. So he completely abandons explicit, logical, conceptually clear reasoning, and he goes into some valid mystical insights, but which don't have a connection with his logical reasoning. And it's like he changes the rules of the game in the middle of the game. I don't think that is true. I think all physical entities are relational, but they are relations between absolute non-physical entities. And when I say non-physical entities, I don't mean spiritual stuff. What I mean is entities in nature that are not exhaustively describable through physical quantities, like um, length in inches, weight in pounds. You know, you, you, you can't give a list of numbers and say everything there is to say about these absolute entities. And therefore, they are not physical in that sense, in the sense that they cannot be described through physical quantities, just like your thoughts or your emotions. What is the length in inches of your thought? What, what is the weight in, in pounds of your emotions? So my contention is that the world is made of mental states, which are out there. They are not our mental states. They are out there, independent of us. But physical stuff is what happens when we measure those mental states. They appear in our cognition on the screen of perception as physical stuff. And therefore, physical stuff is always relational. Um, so uh, so that, 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 I think, was maybe a, a, a misunderstanding that, that you had about where I stand. I'm, I'm not a relativist, uh, a, a metaphysical relativist. I think there is a set of things containing at least one thing that is absolutely and undoubtedly and ultimately true, whatever it is. That is the truth that grounds all the relations. All the relations mm -hmm. are relations between aspects of something that is itself not relational. That's the only way to avoid this infinite regress. Now, what I do agree with what you said is about models. Models are convenient fictions. And um, scientism is what happens when scientists 
lose sight of this fact and they start taking their models for metaphysical truths and and society is 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 filled with this mistake particularly the big mouth self-appointed spokespeople of science who are priests of scientism who are not really practicing science who do not really understand any philosophy um, and but uh, they are very proud of what they think they know which in fact is is a mistake i'm not going to name names but you you can just imagine you know the spokespeople of science who are on tv all the time um, science has been a chain of convenient fictions that are dropped the moment they are no longer convenient to explain this we can use the metaphor i like to use a lot you probably heard me talking about it elsewhere the five-year-old uh, kid that is world champion playing a game a computer mm -hmm. game so imagine that there is a five-year-old kid and he, he is obsessed with a game on his ipad or his iphone whatever and um, he's very good at that, at that game, so good that he wins the world championship. Does that mean that because the kid is so good at playing the game, that the kid understands what's going on, that the kid understands what the game is, that the kid understands all the hardware engineering, all the software engineering mm -hmm. that go into making that game? all the chips, the silicon, the oxides, the transistors, the currents and, and, and voltages going on, and all the primitive assembly instructions that go in that, and the compilers, the, the application programming interfaces. No, the kid knows none of that. What the kid has is not truth. It is a convenient fiction. And it goes like this. I am a little man inside the screen. And there are other little men inside the screen. If I shoot the other little man, I kill them and I score points. If I get shot by the other little man, I die and I don't score points. Now, each element of this fiction is false. There are no little men inside the screen. You are not a little man inside the screen. Nobody's shooting or getting shot. Nobody's scoring points or dying. But the fiction is convenient, so convenient that everything happens as though the fiction were true. And that's good enough for the kid to be a world champion. Now, our technological age is precisely that. We are the five-year-old kids. We can build computers and the internet and fly a man to the moon. We can play the game very well because we have very convenient fictions. Nature behaves as though those fictions were true. And that's all you need to be world champion. You don't need to actually understand what's going on. And the moment the fiction becomes inconvenient because we learn more about nature, you, we drop them and we come up with a new one. Real life examples. When Newton proposed that there was this invisible force called gravity that acted instantaneously and at a distance between the earth and the moon and the earth and an apple, which pulled things towards one another, it took the French 50 years to stop laughing uh, at Newton because the whole idea of a magical, invisible force acting instantaneously and at a distance, so it's absolutely ridiculous. But, and it was, we know since Einstein over a hundred years ago, that it was ridiculous, there is no such force. But we put a man on the moon using that convenient fiction because under certain circumstances, nature behaves as though there were such an invisible force. It isn't there. But it doesn't matter that isn't there, so long as nature, under given circumstances, behaves as though it were, it were there. Just like the five-year-old kid, the game behaves as though you were a little man inside the screen and you can be a world champion based on that fiction. And then came Einstein along and said, no, 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 there is no such magical, invisible force acting instantaneously at a distance. What there is are the contortions of the invisible fabric of space-time. That was the new convenient fiction. And guess what? It was very convenient up until recently. Now we know that that too is not valid. If you, if you stick to that, you cannot reconcile general relativity with quantum field theory. So we have to get rid of that as well. We have to under understand that time itself and therefore the fabric of space time um, is an epiphenomenon of microscopic level quantum processes, which you're trying to figure out now. So the history of science is this history of one convenient fiction replacing another. The problem is that there are always those idiots who take the convenient fiction for the truth, 
and go on television to preach the new religion. And, you know, because life is so, so short, many of them don't get to live long enough to see what they say um, be recognized for the infantile silliness that, that it is. So they, they get away with it, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, in your analogy there, and I think this is, this is the key with these models, you know, the point isn't, you know, all these models, they, you have to be aware of one, like what metric are you trying to, um, maximize or, or, or solve for and to being aware of what what circumstances that model works you know what's the best model for the job and so you know for the for the kid that's playing the game he may be much much better at that than the scientist that it, you know created the the chips and or the programmer that programmed it and it's not that either of them are I mean, which, which is best? Is it best to be the five-year-old that's incredibly good at this game and a world champion is having fun? Or is it the person that's designing it and understands that you're not really the little guy? I mean, it depends on what you're, are you solving for happiness and enjoyment and escapism, or are you solving for having a job and, and creation? And so I think that's the key is to, to be the, the programmer that can go to work and create something that he enjoys and understands that it works that way, and then go home and play the game uh, when he wants to relax and enjoy that. You, you know, Gabe, the thing is, it, science gets a lot, of, a lot of credit today on the back of technology, on the back of engineering, because, of course, engineering depends on science. Engineers need to understand the scientific theories before they can go and develop their technologies. And because we are so advanced technologically compared to only 200 years ago, the time of the great Goethe, um, what we do today is magic, would be magic for Goethe. The smartest man of his time would think that this is all magic, you know, mobile phones, internet, all this stuff. Um, science gets a lot of the credit for that, while the credit rests with engineers. Um, because to develop technology like the five-year-old kid, you don't need to know what is true. You only need to know what works. Mm -hmm. uh, but then scientists get the credit as if they knew what is true, <laughs> which they don't technologists and that's the reality i know i've been one of them for 25 years and i'm still one of them as a hobby but i still you know design computers and video game consoles that you can buy uh, today um what scientists fail to understand is the mindset of the engineer the engineer doesn't give the faintest damn about what is true mm -hmm. engineers don't care engineers care about what works whether it's true or not is irrelevant. Let me list a few things that engineers use knowing that they are not true, but they work. Finite element theory is not true. The physical world is not made of this finite little elements with only local interactions. We know that from physics, but it works well enough. So we use it. Um, Fourier optics is not true. Light is not a continuous analog wave. But for imaginary you see, numbers, you know, I think that's a, a great example. It's not, it's not that you can uh, actually get the square root of something, but it makes things yeah, easier and it works. It, it, I, I will not use this example because there is a big debate in philosophy mm. of mathematics about what the ontic status is of imaginary numbers. Um, gotcha. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to whitewash that. But um, the examples I'm telling you are unquestionably not true. Finite element theory is not true. Fourier optics is not true, but we use it to develop chip scanners. I did it for 15 years working at ASML. Um, something closer to my heart as an electronics engineer. Um, discrete element transition line theory is not true. You know, engineers like me, when we are designing a, a, a chip or a circuit board, we model all the effects of the little traces, the transmission lines that carry an electric signal from one point on the board to another point on the board, or a point in the chip to another point in the chip, we model those with little resistors, inductors, and capacitors. We pretend that there are little resistors, inductors, and capacitors there, discrete ones, in order to model crosstalk, impedance mismatches, 
propagation delay, all this stuff. And it all works. But there aren't any capacitors, resistors, and discrete inductors in there. Who cares? You know, what the truth is, you could say, well, it's Maxwell's equations. It's how the flow of electric charges induces an orthogonal magnetic field that uh, induces, in turn, uh, and the movement of electric charge in neighboring traces. And you can calculate all that with the Maxwell solver. Do we do that? No, it takes too long. It's too expensive. We imagine things that are not there because imagine those things that are not there is good enough. It works. Mm -hmm. Technology is not at all about what is true. It's about what works. And technologists are like the five-year-old kid. We play the game very well. We figured out what works. And we have a little story we tell ourselves in order to make sense to ourselves of why it works. But we know those stories aren't true. Like Newtonian mechanics is not true. Finite element modeling is not true. Fourier optics is not true. Discrete element transmission line theory is not true. So all these miracles of technologies we see around us are not the result of some deep scientific understanding of what's going on. It's not that. If you think it is that, you are naive. You don't know how this stuff is happening. We don't, you don't know the mindset of the people actually doing this stuff. This is us being very clever at playing the game, not knowing what the game is. And mm -hmm. scientism is what arises when you lose this awareness, when you are silly and immature enough to think that because you are a world champion, then you figured out how the iPad works. <laughs> That's what happens when, you do, when you're deluded by that kind of naive fantasy. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, I think it's important to redefine, yeah, what, what truth is. And I think, you know, you encapsulate it well is that, you know, models, they're not true, they, they work. You know, models work and you need to understand what what you're optimizing for, you know. So, yeah, quantum physics might be truer or more descriptive than Newtonian physics, but it's not like you're going to use quantum physics to find waveform functions of where all the atoms in a ball that's coming at you is, you know, you use the model that has the right resolution and is convenient um, for that. And I think, you know, Occam's razor, I want to talk about Occam's razor and <clears throat> Girdle's incompleteness theorem, because I think having having that understanding that models are stories that we tell ourselves to um yeah to achieve certain goals to give us power um, to make things work um it allows you to be non-attached from that and occam's razor i think is often from my understanding misunderstood as you know the the explanation that has the fewer um metaphysical elements or the fewer the simplest explanation is the the one that's more true my understanding is that it's more all models you know are not true themselves but if you can explain if you can get the same results with one model that's much more complicated that requires many more parts to get to that same um conclusion uh or the same result as another model that uses fewer parts because neither of them are true in and of themselves you know the, the one that's simpler is the, the favorable one and that's what you, I think, talk about well with uh, monism, um, idealism is that, yes, all these models are describing things. Ultimately, if you get down to two different things, like things are uh, mind and matter, how do you know that you haven't gone far enough? And if, if there is a model out there that just uses one thing, which is consciousness, which is experience, which is truly the only thing that we actually know, because that's, that is the only thing, everything that we all matter, all measurements, everything in the quote unquote physical world or within time um, we've experienced through consciousness. So if you can create a internally consistent model through monism, through idealism, um, that it's not that materialism is wrong. It's just that materialism is kind of this um, heuristic model that works, you know, it, it it works better to think materialistically for many purposes rather than diving into the consciousness. Um, but you have to nest these models and contextualize them uh, within uh, correctly. I, I think I would go even further. I would say materialism is, is not a model that even works anymore. 
um, I, I'll tell you what works and why we conflate it with materialism. But but first, wh where does materialism not work? Materialism cannot make sense of the failure of non-contextuality in foundations of physics. We know now that we cannot say that physical entities have properties, defined properties, before you measure them. And, and, and that's a presupposition of materialism. Materialism, the first starting presupposition is that physical entities are primary and fundamental. They are irreducible. In other words, they must have standalone reality. They must exist by themselves, independent of whether you're measuring them or not. A physical entity has the properties it has, whether you are looking at it or not. Measurement simply discloses a property that was already there immediately before you make the measurement. Well, that is experimentally not true. No, Nobel Prize in Physics 2022 went to a series of experiments that for over four decades has closed every loophole that could have avoided this conclusion. And now the conclusion is unavoidable short of some theoretical fantasies for which there is no empirical proof like Everestian parallel universes or the undefined magical hidden variables of superdeterminism. If, if you don't want to entertain that kind of theoretical fantasy, you have to admit that uh, the principle of non-contextuality is refuted and therefore materialism is refuted because it presupposes that. Or our inability to account for the qualities of experience in terms of the physical parameters of brain function. We've been trying at great cost for a, a century uh, to figure it out and it's impossible. So I would say materialism is not convenient for that either because for instance, it fails when you realize that uh, a number of things, but let's take one, psychedelics. Psychedelics induce the, the richest, the most intense experience of your life by reducing your brain activity and not increasing it anywhere beyond measurement error. So that's not what materialism would have predicted. So it's not uh, convenient for that either. I think materialism is not convenient. It's, it's, it's confusing. It does nothing. It does not help. What did help since the Enlightenment was the acknowledgement that there is an objective world beyond our individual minds. There is a world beyond our minds. That doesn't entail or imply that that world is not mental. <laughs> Look, m my thoughts are mental, but they are outside your mind. My thoughts would still be here even if you're not there. You cannot change my thoughts by wishing them to be different, by doing your morning affirmations. My thoughts, from your perspective, are objective and external. But they are mental, just like your wishes and your fantasies and your own thoughts. You see? So what helped was this separation that started with Galileo between the scientist and the thing the scientist is observing. The scientist did not commit an error that many committed before, which is to project onto the world one's own fantasies and beliefs. The scientist decided that that was not the way to go about it. The way to understand the world was not to fantasize about it, like the scholastics had done for two centuries before the Renaissance, um, but to observe and see what the world actually is, as opposed to what we think or wish it to be. That separation is very useful, but it's not materialism. It's realism. It's not even physical realism. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what the nature is of the states of the world out there outside your mind. It doesn't matter what their nature is. What was useful is the acknowledgement that there are states out there in the world that are independent of your own mind. Now, materialism endorses that, but then goes much further. Beyond just saying, yes, there is an external world beyond our minds, it, it takes the next step and says, and that external world is not mental. Well, there is no justification for this next step. This next step is a conflation. It's, it's mistaking the notion of external states for the notion of non-mental states. And I can even understand the psychology that goes into that. You know, my mind, my internal states are mental. If I'm saying that there are other states out there, I may be tempted, if I'm not a good thinker, to say, well, they, and then because they are out there and they are not mine, then they are also non-mental. But this is a complete non sequitur. In other words, it's not a logical step at all. It's completely arbitrary. It parachutes out of nothing. Um, 
The historical reason for that is that the, the scientists in the early Enlightenment, the late Renaissance, they saw Bruno being burned at the stake by the church. So they had to come up with a narrative, with a story they could tell the culture to say, we are no threat to the church. The church has domain over the psyche, which the Greek word that also translates into soul and spirit. So the church has the domain over mind, soul, spirit. We are not busy with that. Our external states are non-mental. Therefore, we are no threat to the church. And there's very good reason to believe that uh, that saved the lives and the livelihoods of many scientists back then. But around the middle of the 19th century, we forgot that that was a political move, not a logical or empirical one. And that also had to do with the, you know, the psychosocial circumstances of the time and the bourgeoisie trying not only to survive the hegemony of the clergy, but to supplant the, the clergy as the intellectual you know, tone setters uh, of the culture. And then we forgot what was clear to Denis Diderot, one of the founders of the Enlightenment, one of the two authors of La, Encyclo La Encyclopédie, the founding document of the Enlightenment, who is on record saying, materialism doesn't work, but we need it as a weapon against the church. You know, he is on record in writing saying that. But uh, by the time Nietzsche talked, started talking about the death of God, we had forgotten that. Darwin provided the last sort of coup de grace, coup de grace against, against the church by taking away from them the power to explain life. And that went up the heads of the intellectual elites of the time. They got drunk into their own you know, snake oil. Uh, they gulped it down. And we started emerging out of that delusion only with Thomas Nagel's 1974 paper, What is it like to be a bat? And we are still trying to... To, to, to get away from that today. That's the story of my life because I was born in 1974, uh, the year Nagel's paper came mm -hmm. out and the year Federico Fagin at uh, Zilog created the Z80 microprocessor that started the computer revolution um, that we are still living through today. It's been the two themes of my life. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's where girls in completeness theorem and I know I was introduced to it through Donald Hoffman's work. Um, but it's, you know, this is a simplification because it's not my area, but this idea that any model, any proof, you have to go into it with some, um, priors or, or some axioms, some things that you assume, uh, assume to be true. You're asking, Hey, give me these miracles. And then assuming these miracles, I can prove the rest. <clears throat> um, Girls in completeness theorem, to my understanding, shows that there there is those will inevitably never be able to be proven within that model. And so, any model that we have, we have to have some sense of humility or understanding that that it is it is based on a, a miracle or or something, and that allows I think contextualizes these as models, and that there's going to be infinite. Um, continual progression and kind of a fractal expansion. And one, one example to me that I think encapsulates this is this idea of photogrammetry or, you know, you're taking these two, two dimensional images. Um, and if you take enough of them, well, if you're, you know, we live in, we experience in three dimension, three dimensional space, you've got a coin. Um, if you look at it from one side, if you have a two dimensional picture of a coin on one side, you're absolutely positive it's tails. Somebody else can be looking at it from the other side, it's heads. You know, those are that's seemingly a paradox. If, you, if you're just living in a two dimensional world, if you have no concept that there's a higher dimension, um, you have these two paradoxical things that you're absolutely sure um, are can't be both true. Um, but if you take enough of these two dimensional pictures, if you have some understanding that what I'm seeing is some slice or downsampling of some ultimate reality that, that I may not fully be capturing. If you kind of hold your conclusions and you take more and more of these two dimensional pictures of a three dimensional object, eventually this higher dimension starts to emerge some way of thinking, some model where you can see, oh yes, those are both true from within their limited perspective, within the axioms that they, um, made their models, but there's also a way in which both of those are true. And, um, yeah, you have this model that, that collapses both of those. I see that kind of 
the science and um, religion, looking at two sides of the coin, trying to describe both having models that they feel like work and depending on what those people are experiencing or what they're trying to understand in their life. For some people, religion makes a lot more sense, other people, science. But ultimately, I think they're all models that um, as we see where they fail and unlearn what we think we know, uh, there is some convergence um, that explains phenomenon better. I, I even think the very approach <clears throat> of science and religion, they differ not only in their methods, religion being based on introspection and science being based on empirical observation and logical reasoning. <clears throat> so they clearly di differ in methodology, but I think they differ even in their goals. Um, science tries to predict what nature is going to do next. And religion tries to infer what nature is. And these are two different things. One is metaphysical. Being uh, is what metaphysics study, is that which lies behind behavior. If something behaves, for it, for it to behave, it first needs to be. And behavior is physics, and beingness is that which stands behind physics, which is then metaphysics or metaphysics. Um, while science doesn't care about metaphysics. It doesn't care what about, about what nature is. It only cares about predicting what nature will do next. That's the litmus test of scientific theories. You, you can falsify it only by predicting what nature will do. Then you run an experiment. If, if nature does otherwise, then your theory is falsifiable. And all scientific, your theory is falsified. And all scientific theories need to be falsifiable. You need to be able to, to either disprove them or tentatively confirm them through experiment. Um, what you mentioned about uh, Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorem brings us back to how we started this conversation, which is how far can you go with a mechanical type of thinking? And you know, people with a background in computers, they are well aware of both the power and the limitations of mechanistic thinking. Um, and Gödel's theorem uh, formalizes those limitations of mechanistic systems. Uh, strictly speaking, you call them formal systems. In other words, systems that are based on a set of axioms and a set of derivation rules. Um, and on the basis of those, you can prove or disprove a number of things within the formalism of the system. Mathematics is a formal system. Any programming language is a formal system. Um, the equations of physics are formal systems because they leverage mathematics and the rule the axioms and the rules of derivation of mathematics and uh, you know if you go back to the history in the beginning of the 20th century alfred north whitehead and uh, and russell they thought we need to sort of lay down the basic foundations of mathematics what are the basic axioms and the basic derivation rules that allow us to apply mathematics beyond just our intuitive sense that uh, mathematics is true. It's self-evidently true, right? Well, no, if, it's, if it is really true, then you should be able to explicitly uh, prove why it's true. And that's what uh, Whitehead and Russell set out to do in the Principia Mathematica, a tour de force, three volumes. Um, it, it famously took them over 200 pages to prove that one plus one really is two, is, really is two <laughs> as opposed to just, you know, presupposing that or, or, or mm -hmm. taking that as a convention. Um, what Gödel showed is that uh, Whitehead's and, 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 and Russell's attempt was uh, doomed intrinsically, fundamentally doomed, because what he showed was that any formal system is either incomplete or internally contradictory. In other words, given a set of axioms and rules of derivation or theorems, um, you can either not prove everything that is true according to that formal system, or you will prove things that are not true. Um, and if you look at the proof Godot wrote, what breaks any formal system are self-referential statements. It's when the system tries to say something about itself. Then it, then it all goes downhill. It all, all goes to hell there. Um, that's how he proved uh, these incompleteness theorems. And notice that mechanistic thinking is formal system thinking. This is 
what mechanistic thinking is. You have some axioms, you have some rules of derivation. They can have many different embodiments. They can be cogs on a, on a, on a machine, or they can be uh, gates, transistor-based gates on a computer, but you can exhaustively describe them and define their behavior in terms of FOMO systems. So they are FOMO systems. So Godot proved that you can only go so far in mechanistic thinking um, because when that mechanistic thinking is applied to itself, it's internally contradictory. It sort of falls apart. So if our minds apply mechanistic thinking to themselves, then there are fundamental errors um, that will be incurred. And, and you can prove that mathematically uh, like Gödel did. So this is why I'm very cautious about thinking about people to this day ignoring Gödel and thinking that we one day be able to get to a mathematically formalized theory of everything that is infallible and it will predict everything that nature can ever do. Mm -hmm. and it, this, this is fundamentally impossible, and we have known that for over a century now. Uh, but the fantasy has a powerful gr uh, hold on our intellectual elites to this day. Uh, and that's because of fluid compensation. We lost religion, so we have to find meaning in closure. So we will ignore reason. We will ignore evidence in order to hold on to the fantasy of complete closure, getting one up on nature by figuring it all out. Imagine mm. that. Monkeys running around a rock for only 200,000 years, thinking conceptually for only about 30,000 years, and, and entertaining the fantasy that they can figure it all out. This is pathetic. It's like an ant telling you it can, it can find the grand unified theory. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's so easy to yeah look at an ant farm and and realize like oh yeah I mean they have a model that works for them they get what they want done but of course they they don't know the ultimate you know everything and then we turn around and go into the delusion that that we can um, so I think I want to I'll I'll try to summarize I guess my interpretation or, or my um, view of kind of dreams and dissociation and that as, again, just a, a model that I think is useful. Um, and then you can let me know kind of where you differ or if I encapsulated it. Um, but I mean, my understanding, my view of idealism, you know, philosophy, idealism, monism is that, you know, rather than there being, uh, but I agree that if we can have a model that explains things, uses one miracle rather than two, um, and it works, that it that it's preferable. Um, and I see where physicalism or materialism fails. Like I think it is, it's useful to think of consciousness as an emergent phenomenon to some degree, but it but it ultimately is just a just a model and um, is absurd when you really try to think of how you would make that leap. You know, I like what Don Hoffman talks about, you know, how how do you make the leap from uh, uh, neurotransmitters and some confirmation of atoms to the experience of chocolate? So, so the idea of idealism um, is that everything is ultimately mental. There is one mental, one this consciousness, whatever you want to define that. To me, experience, um, and yet there is a way that that unified consciousness that there are also dissociations or parts of that, that, that have separate experiences, um, independently don't have the experience of the full consciousness ultimately at, to some level are part of the one, but they're also individuals as well. And, and for people hearing this, I mean, it is very foreign and I mean, it's just not the experience that we have. We experience being individual, being separate. The idea that to some people, it totally makes sense. They're like, oh yeah, I'm part of the earth. I'm part of the universe. I'm part of everything. Other people from a more logical physicalist background, like, no, I am separate from all these things around me. Um, but dreams are an experience where uh, every night our unified brain, our mental structure that's Bernardo, that's Gabe, 
um, goes to sleep, enters into a state, our conscious awareness goes from being one individual in an outside world to now that consciousness, we are a dream avatar that is experiencing a world, experiencing people, experiencing phenomena that feel outside of ourselves. Um, and people can tell us jokes, people can threaten us, you know, there are monsters, etc. cetera. Um, we're experiencing space, you know, in the dream, we, we can be absolutely positive that we're experiencing matter and space and time. And if somebody came up to us in the dream and said, you know, this is all this matter that you're experiencing, it's actually comes from consciousness. And they look, no, I, I, I see it. You know, if it's a very lucid dream, perhaps we could, or very detailed dream, you know, we could get out our dream microscopes and we could maybe see some rudimentary laws that might be somewhat consistent, or at least would um, lead us to, to conclude that, that it's real, separate than us. But ultimately, you know, if you take a step back, the, the whole environment of the dream, the other people, the dream avatar, um, even the rules, space and time, all those are coming from a self contained mental structure, something that in normal consciousness, day to day consciousness, uh, is creating a unified experience that is interacting with supposedly an external world. Um, and to go beyond that, uh, because it is odd to think about everything in your dream actually coming from you. And I think that, you know, this is where, you know, dream, dream work and, and Jungian things come from is like, well, yeah, that, that other person in your dream, you think that that may represent somebody else in your life, but it also represents a part of you because that ultimately came from your neural networks, your past. Um, and, and there is that part of you as well. Uh, you brought up in one of the interviews I listened to, um, a study of people with dissociative identity disorder. So this is, um, again, another example, even if you're not looking at dreams, this is a, a mind, a mental network that you would think is normally just one unified ego, one person. Um, but these are people that are literally experiencing, they have different individuals within one mind. And sometimes that dissociation is so severe and you know it's used to be called multiple personality disorder where different individuals at different ages different identities take over and maybe the main alter ego that may not have any conscious recollection of what happened when that other individual um, or that other alter ego took over so we have another example of how one mind that should be working all together can have very dissociated parts that are not aware of the other um, parts um, but you brought up that there's even a, a study where some percentage of the people, when they ask these individuals with dissociative identity disorder to recall their dreams, depending on which alter ego they were talking to, the alter egos would recall the same dream, but as different characters in the same dream. So I think further cements this idea that as bizarre it is, as it is, um, we have examples that show us how one mental, one mind, uh, you can be part of one mind that you're not aware of interacting with other parts of that mind, um, over some, through the process of dissociation and, and yet it ultimately is one mind and is op can operate at that level, um, in other environments or, or simultaneously. So any, any thoughts on corrections or differences in that you have with that explanation? No, uh, the, the motivation for this is, is the following. Under idealism, um, the states of the world outside are mental, just like our inner states are mental. Uh, under materialism, the states of the world outside are physical, they are other than mental. And it, it, it is this metaphysical difference that is supposed to create the boundary between us and the world, which doesn't really work because under materialism, even our inner mental processes or mental states are ultimately physical as well. So you end up in the same problem. But under idealism, we have to explain why there is an outside. If everything is mental states, mental states out there, mental states in here, 
what is it that defines the boundary that allows us to speak of an in here as opposed to an out there? Because this, this presupposes a boundary, a division of some sort that separates the external mental states from our internal mental states. Otherwise, they would be all in one mind and there would be no inside outside. There would be just this one mind. So um, under idealism, it is dissociation that does that, which is a phenomenon we have known in mental space in the minds of humans for at least two centuries. Um, but we have known for sure that it's a real condition and not just patients dissimulating to, to, to get attention. We've known for sure that it is so since the turn of the century. So since the early 2000s with, with the advent of neuroimaging, like functional MRI, like uh, sophisticated MEG instrumentation that we didn't have before, uh, things that have very good spatial and temporal resolution to measure our brain activity. Since then, we know that dissociation is for real because it can be diagnosed objectively through a brain scan. Uh, there is a paper published by Yolanda Schlum in the Netherlands in 2014 uh, that did just that. They took a group of clinically diagnosed patients with dissociative identity disorder. They hired a group of actors as controls and they ask the actors to pretend to themselves, which is a known acting technique, to pretend to themselves to be dissociated. In other words, to dissimulate. And they put both groups in a brain scanner and then they asked radiologists to separate the scans into two groups without knowing from which patient or which actor it came. So double blind. And they could separate it. So dissociation looks like something specific under a brain scanner. And under idealism, all we need to do is to extrapolate this, this thing that we know happens in a human mind, to extrapolate it upwards to the rest of nature and say, if nature is one big set of mental states, then it is dissociation that creates these boundaries between the inside and the outside. And life is what dissociation looks like. Just like Yolanda Schlumpf knew what dissociation in the mind of a human looked like on a brain scanner except that we, in this case, we are inside the skull of nature. So we just need to look around to see what other dissociative processes look like. And lo and behold, it's life, it's biology, it is metabolism, because there seems to be this tremendous correlation between metabolism and entities reporting or betraying the presence of a mental inner life separate from the world. Like if I step on my cat's tail, I see a reaction. But if I step on the floor next to my cat's tail, I don't see a reaction that betrays that my cat, which is also a metabolizing organism, has a private mental inner life separate from the rest of the world, separate from the floor, because the cat only screams if I step on the cat's tail, and not on the floor next to the tail. And so that's the idea under analytic idealism. Life, fundamentally, is what dissociation looks like in one universal field of subjectivity of which we are all parts. And that's why we can speak of an inside and an outside. The boundary that defines it are dissociative boundaries. And death is thus then the end of the dissociative boundary. It's the end of the dissociation, not the end of subjectivity. It is the reintegration of uh, a seemingly separate segment of the subjectivity of nature it is the reintegration of that and its mental contents into the rest of the fabric of reality. So nothing is really lost, which many people experience as a hopeful thing. I have a different relationship with it, but uh, it's good that people experience it as a hopeful thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, from Donald Hoffman's model, which is different than this, but ultimately, you know, I think is another very logical and compelling and you know, backed up with his, uh, computer models that, you know, we're not seeing, um, we're not seeing an objective reality veridically through our perception. And so he talks about the, the VR headsets. Um, so from his model, I think it's, it's very logical that space and time are not fundamental, but they're constructs by which, you know, this, I think this dissociation process is, downsampling, you know, the one an infinitely complex, or at least a, a much higher complexity, um, of reality that we're experiencing, um, space, time, this sense of self and other all seem to be hacks by which we are 
processing and modulating into a level that we can understand. Um, so his model, space and time, are not fundamental. I think in I think there's a lot of implications of looking at dreams and this dissociative process as well. I mean, in the dream, you're experiencing space, you're experiencing time. Um, it's not fundamental. It is a somewhat, I guess, emergent phenomenon of consciousness. And there are even, you know, I think looking at a computer system too, you know, if you, you can run a, a virtual machine on your computer and, you know, if I've got a computer and then I run 10 virtual machines that each are clones of the operating system. And then within each of those, you've got 10 virtual machines. There is some degree at which the processing power, um, depending on how far down the stack you go is not going to be, it's not the full processing power. And so I think that's, that shows how in the dream, yes, yeah, space and time, they're different. They are of a different quality and, and people say, well, I know that like real life, waking life is real, but the dream's not real, but you don't know the dream's not real until you're outside of the dream at, at a level, at a, another level. And, and every logical explanation for why you know the dream's not real only really applies typically unless you're lucid dreaming at the higher level of the stack. And so they're kind of going back to girls and completeness theorem, you know, they're, we can only be so confident that we're not in, in another level and that there aren't these simultaneous or fractally nested, um, nature of reality. So I think, you know, Stephen Wolfram's stuff, it's interesting to, to hear even from his model, which is like, Hey, can we do these simple, simple rules that, um, appear complex because we got these limited computational bounds. Um, does that explain physics? And his conclusion too, is that, that space, time, the laws of physics are all relative to the, the computational bounds where we are kind of in this stack as well. So I think, I think there is a lot, um, of interesting implications that we can see from dreams and we should at least question, are those principles also not applicable at, at this level of reality? Of course. Um, and to acknowledge this is not to surrender reason and the grounded practice of science because although our experience of the world and our thoughts about what's real and what's not of course they are all a function of our particular cognitive system and our particular state of mind it can't be otherwise our theories emerge from our cognition not the other way around so we have to acknowledge that but despite that despite this sort of relative perspective on what we can affirm about reality despite that there is one thing we can always do we can always correct our own prior mistakes we have authority over our, our own mistakes in a way that we do not have authority over what is really true out there you see what i mean because we mm -hmm. own our mistakes but it's the out there that own, uh, owns us and not the other way around. So things are slippery and relative when it comes to our relationship with that which encompasses us. But by the same token, we do have authority over that which we encompass, which is our own prior mistakes. And the grounded practice of philosophy and science is not about ultimate truths. Monkeys are not in the business of ultimate truths. Only very deluded monkeys think that they are in that business. Monkeys mm -hmm. very caught in in fluid compensation with a very visceral, almost pathological, psychological need for closure. Uh, but uh, reasonable monkeys are not in that game. Reasonable monkeys are in the game of figuring out what they have done wrong, owning their prior mistakes and correcting them, and therefore giving us reason to believe that we are getting closer to truth 
but it may be a limit. We may be getting closer forever and not getting there, you know, like the concept of limits in mathematics mm -hmm. and calculus. Um, so I think that is the grounded and reasonable attitude to our, you know, epistemic efforts towards acquiring more knowledge. The attitude is let us own our mistakes. Let us own the places where we contradicted our own uh, our own cognition, where we incurred into internally inconsistent uh, views and statements. And let's correct them and try to be increasingly less wrong and try to arrive at an internally consistent model that is also empirically adequate. And not think of that as the ultimate truth, but think of that as the best monkeys can do. And, and this is still grounded. It's still grounded in reason because you're trying to avoid internal inconsistencies, internal contradictions. It's also grounded in empirical observation because you're trying to come, come up with a model that doesn't contradict what you observe and is still not incurring in the fatal mistake of thinking that we achieve ultimate closure, that we have figured out everything that is salient about nature despite being monkeys running around a rock with conceptual thinking for only 30,000 years. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I hear a lot of, you know, I listen to some debates from Mormons and people that have left Mormonism and, and many people that leave high demand religions, they often swing, I, I think, because of that need for closure um, and they go through this chaotic, like, you know, I knew everything now I know nothing. Um, often they cling to something else, which is often kind of a materialist atheist perspective of like, oh, okay, now I know everything again. It's just a different uh, everything. Um, and so I listen to these kind of nonsensical debates between theists and atheists sometime. And, and one thing that often it, the, the theist attacks the atheist as of like, well, morality, like, where do you get morality from? Because, you know, is it just evolution? And it, that itself is not, it's not a logical arg argument, just that because you're uncomfortable with letting go of this idea of morality, and you don't see any sense of morality um, on the other side, that your side is true. Um, but I think this perspective of dissociation and dreams, I mean, and idealism, monism, like this is where you get you know, an objective morality, again, is this idea that you aren't just yourself. I mean, you aren't just the dream avatar um, at some level of being. Uh, those other things are are you, this higher self perspective of you. Yes, you're the dream avatar. That's what you're experiencing. But you will wake up at some point in linear time, if we're talking linear time, and realize that all the aspects of the dream represent parts of what you have inside of you, parts of how you're thinking and processing things. Um, and those, you know, it's, it's evidence with the dissociative identity disorder individuals because they literally are, um, those other parts of the dreams are so dissociated that those exist in the waking life as well. And I listened to a, or I read a fascinating book that had like 20 or 30 pages of transcripts between a therapist and an individual with dissociative identity disorder that ultimately were able to cure, be cured of it um, over a process of several years and um, uh, their individual pro protocol that involved um, kind of guided reparenting. Each of the alter egos had their own parents that had exactly what they, they needed that caused that dissociative split due to trauma in their life. Um, and ultimately, they became an integrated individual without several alter egos that would take over. And so I think if you really do rest into this idea that, yes, I have this conscious experience that I am separate from everything else. Um, but at some level, this is all mental. This is the one. Um, and I am those other parts. I'm the other people. I'm the world that I'm living in. I'm the earth. Um, and this is what Christ talked about is, you know, treat, you know, what are the two great commandments is love others and, uh, and as yourself and love God. Well, if God, the one is others, you know, it's just one commandment, which is love, treat others. And it, it's, it is impossible to some degree to fully put yourself in somebody else's perspective and say, well, how would I feel? 
um, in this scenario. And it's a little harder when you're going kind of up or down these cognitive uh, light cones as Michael Levin talks, you know, how, you know, what, how should I treat the earth? Um, but ultimately it is part of you, this other definition of self, it comes down to a definition of self and living in such a way, you know, if you're in a relationship with somebody, okay, there is a me, there is a them, but there is also an us. And how can I live in a way that I would be okay with what happens to me? And I would be okay being on the other end of this. And this is also what's best for, um, the, the unit unity. So, I mean, I think this is the solution. There is a way to have pretty objective moral ethics from uh, a model that doesn't involve uh, what we call sky daddy sometimes in the post-Mormon community. But I don't know your thoughts on that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, on their idealism, there is only one subject in nature just like there is only one subject behind all the outer personalities of a patient with dissociative identity disorder, all those outers were the patient. In exactly the same way, you could say that uh, all of us are nature, not only in an abstract way, but in a very visceral, concrete way. The subject behind your eyes, the subject looking at the world from behind your eyes, and experiencing your own thoughts and emotion in your life is the same subject that is looking at, at the world behind my eyes and experiencing my thoughts and emotions. Think of it, think of thoughts and emotions er, 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 as trees and buildings along the lane. They are not yours, they are things you experience as you walk down the lane. So you can walk one lane today and another lane tomorrow. And you will see different trees and buildings. Thoughts and emotions are the same. The subject is walking down my lane and experiencing my memories, my emotions, my thoughts. In other words, the trees and buildings in my lane. It's the same subject walking down your lane and experiencing other trees and buildings, other thoughts, other emotions, other memories. Uh, the problem is that we mistake subjectivity for the contents of subjectivity. We think that the trees and buildings are the person walking down the lane. And that's where we go wrong. That's where this whole sense of individual identity, mm -hmm. which is illusory, you're not even the self you were in terms of the contents of yourself. You're not even the same person you were a week ago, let alone the person you were when you're five years old. There were very different buildings and trees down that lane when you're five years old. Um, not a single atom in your body has remained in your body since then. Some may have left and returned, but not a single one has remained. Um, so this is grounds for, for a form of ethics that does justice to the understanding that behind somebody else's eyes, it's you. And that somebody else's suffering is your suffering. That is also the danger of idealism, as I discovered myself. Um, um, although I practice analytic philosophy by temperament, I am a continental philosopher. In other words, for me, analytic philosophy is not a job that I do. It's not a theory. It, uh, it's what calibrates my life. It's, mm. it's the lens through which I experience my, my own self, my own life. I live and embody my philosophy. I don't just write papers about my philosophy, which is what most analytic philosophers do today. Continental philosophers were not like that. Kierkegaard embodied his philosophy. Nietzsche embodied his philosophy. philosophy. Heidegger embodied his philosophy. All, 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 all the great continental philosophers embodied their philosophy. And I find myself in that position, not by choice, but by, because of the way I'm put together, because of my temperament. And what this has done to me over the years is that um, my empathy level has grown to becoming almost dysfunctional. Uh, since the war in Ukraine broke out, the first year of the war, I became almost dysfunctional. I couldn't sleep knowing that there were people hiding cold metro stations because they were being bombed or thinking of the people cold in the trenches and being blown to pieces every day. You become almost dysfunctional when you experience all of that with the awareness that is you in the trenches. It is mm -hmm. you in that cold metro station. 
Um, and, and then you have to find very pragmatic ways to, to manage it. Um, and I, I'm slowly finding, and sometimes I, there is a bump on the road. What happened on the 7th of October in Israel was a big thing for me. I thought all the progress I had made over the past 22 months had gone down the drain because I became completely consumed by that, totally consumed. By it. it took days to emerge out of, of, of that. So you have to pragmatically convince yourself that um, although it is important to visit the mental room of empathy regularly, because if you don't do that, you lose your own humanity. Um, and you don't want to do that. You, you don't want to lose your humanity. You, you will become something that you don't even want to know what you will become. But you cannot live in that room because it will help no one. It will not help the Ukrainians. It will not help the Israelis. It will not help the Palestinians, which is my latest big bump on the road, um, for you to become dysfunctional. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody else. So you have to find some pragmatic ways to emerge out of that. But... Um, what it has shown me is that ethics is not something you invent. It's not something that you decide out of a long line of reasoning what is and what is not ethical, like ethics philosophers do today. And there is, there is value to that. But ethics, first and foremost, is what you feel from within immediately out of your own humanity. It dispenses with reasoning, with explanation, with defense, with proof with narratives, stories, justifications, and then none of this nonsense is required for true ethics. It emerges out of you on its, on its own. It is, it is like a force of nature, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But um, if you become blind to that, which is what life tends to do to people, life is hard. It, it, it knocks you a lot. Uh, it tests your, tests everything um, about you. Um, it has a way to break you, doesn't matter how strong you are. And our natural response to this is to insulate ourselves so much because we feel that if, if, if we suffer even a, a little bit more, we'll fall apart. And, it, and, and we may. We may. It's very hard to keep it together. Um, and that defense, that ego defense mechanism can be so strong that it starts insulating us not only from life, but from our own humanity. And then we no longer feel the fountain of ethics that naturally is just, you know, gushing within us. We, we protect ourselves against that too. And, and, and then we may sense that we suffer less, but we become inhuman. And, and, and that is the great danger. Now, there's something you said earlier to which I agree wholeheartedly. Um, during the new atheist movement, which was big in the first 15 years of this century, now it's sort of dead. Um, we went through that phase as a society, but uh, when it was playing out strongly, um, it's, it, it was peculiar for me to realize that a lot of the people who were the most outspoken members of neo-atheism, the most outspoken critics of religion, they had a very strong religious background when they were children. Mm -hmm. And it brought me to, to that thinking that maybe what's happening here is a very natural psychological reaction they are trying to take revenge on their former selves. They are ashamed and angry at their younger selves. They think they were foolish and deluded, and they are angry at their former selves. And the way to take revenge at their former selves is to viciously criticize the religious people of today because you project your former self on them, and then you try to torture them because you're angry at yourself. So you, you, you tortured yourself by proxy. Um, and then I tried to square that up with my own upbringing. My mother was a practice, is a practicing Catholic, but she not only never forced me into Catholicism, she never even encouraged me <laughs> for some reason. Um, I saw her pray every now and then, and uh, I experienced her practice uh, in, in two ways. It was clear to me it made her more peaceful, more calm, so that could only be a good thing. But it was also clear to me that um, she had a relationship with a mystery, with something transcendent, transcendent in the sense of not being cognizable through our normal conceptual dictionary. 
and that stayed with me. Um, but because she never forced uh, that on me, that memory never became something to be bitter about. It was just a curious thing that remained curious throughout my life. Like, what was that? There was something that I sensed was rich and valuable in that. And I couldn't really wrap my head around it. And it's today, to this day, it's my impression. There is something rich and important about religion. Something that I cannot quite grasp, but I see it's in there. And, and I never wanted to take revenge on that because it never attacked me, if you know what I mean. My father, on the other hand, was very science oriented, had uh, had uh, subscriptions to Scientific American, popular electronics. And, you know, he, he, he was a, a prolific hobbyist. He was a ham radio operator. He built electronic stuff at home. He bred rare tropical fish in the aquarium. He built and, and, and used the little radio controlled model airplanes. In other words, stuff so fused with science. And I grew up with that. So for me, both science and religion are positive parts of my memories. And I don't have an ax to grind against either one of them. So I never became a fundamentalist religious person. And I never became a atheist with an ax to grind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And in contrast to what I think is the background of you know, Richard Dawkins and some other of those people... Um, there is one skeptic who I think has matured a lot and who I respect to get today. Um, he used to be the editor of Skeptic magazine. Um, and he also had a background like that, a religious fundamentalist mm. background that was forced on him by his parents, the society where he lived in. And, uh, and that started his journey towards atheism and skepticism. Today, he's a much healthier skeptic i think i'm not going to to mention his name but i think most of your of your audience will know who i'm talking about especially if you know that i just told you it's somebody i know in person um so to me this and, and why am i saying all this now because of what you mentioned that um, atheists they they are confronted by religious people with the question okay okay where does your ethics come from right I don't recognize that question, even in the absence of idealism. So even if we forget that it's the same subject looking behind everybody's eyes, including your own, even if you ignore that, I do not grant the implicit logic that uh, losing uh, religion somehow risks our ethics. And the reason is this. Uh, religion, when interpreted literally, which I think is a disservice to religion, it sort of squashes its richness down into something flat and silly. It, you lose all the depth if you make an effort to interpret religion literally. The, the message is much deeper, much more subtle. Uh, it's exquisitely rich. But if you interpret it literally, then the validity of ethics is based on the notion that there is... Um, a more intelligent, more conscious, divine entity that hands you the book of ethics. And the validity of it is grounded in this higher agent, God or angels or Shiva, whatever your religion makes of it. Um, but I think that's a tricky psychological defense mechanism because what it does it withdraws from us the responsibility for ethics. Ethics comes now from the outside. It's a God-given something. It's handed, us, handed over to us as a kind of law that we have to follow, but which we are not responsible for. Our responsibility is to follow it. We don't have the, responsib the responsibility to figure it. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and that probably is very comforting if you believe in that. I do not believe that. I think the responsibility for discerning the ethical way to live rests squarely with us. We are the metacognitive eyes of nature. Everything else is a play of instinct. It is semi-conscious. 
we, thanks to four billion years of bloody, violent evolution and suffering, have de developed the capacity to metacognize, to be self-aware, and to pass value judgment. We are the only creatures in nature that can say, this is good and this is not good. The rest of nature doesn't do that. The rest of nature just is. Now, a pride of lions, <laughs> I mention this example often because it marked my youth. I saw one of these Discovery Channel's documentaries in the 90s, um, and they filmed a pride of lion isolating an elephant from the rest of its group, an adult elephant, bringing the elephant down, and then the entire pride of lions started eating that elephant from the hind legs up, and they ate that elephant for six hours before the elephant passed out. That is nature. None of those lions is asking itself, am I making this elephant suffer? You know, should, sh should we go about this business in a different way? Should we only eat animals that we can kill instantly with a bite to the neck, as opposed to an animal big like this that can bleed for six hours of excruciating suffering before it even loses consciousness? Nobody is asking that. They didn't evolve to the point where they can, they can ask those questions and pass those value judgments. But we did at great cost, four billion years of suffering. Here we are, we can pass those value judgments. The responsibility for ethics rests squarely with us. So for me, the, res the ethical responsibility feels a lot heavier than I think it would feel if I took my ethical responsibility to be simply that of looking up a book given from outside powers. For me, it's a much heavier, lived, concrete reality than it would otherwise be. So I do not see why religious people think that atheists um, are devoid of ethics. I'm not an atheist. I don't have an ax to grind. I, I, I'm very open to the idea of a divinity. I think it's true, to be honest with you. I, I am a sympathizer of religion. I don't sympathize with religious institutions. Mm -hmm. I think they have done horrendous things in history. Uh, but the religious attitude is one I adopt my in my life in my own way. Uh, so I don't see this, this reasoning why atheism equals a lack of ethics. I think it can, in fact, equal a much deeper, more personal relationship with ethics than that that you would experience if you thought ethics is just something handed down to you. Yeah, and I thought uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I think I, I yeah, wholeheartedly heartily agree. I think, um, again, that the moral spiritual implications of monism, idealism, the recognition that ultimately, if you keep looking, there is only one, uh, it, I mean, it is the, the key to, I think climate change, uh, to the, polarization and politics and, and across religion and whatnot. Um, and I think, yeah, recognizing that, I mean, you can look to not only to dreams, but to psychology, the way people heal, you know, I think we're learning more and more, you know, you don't go to therapy and heal because you say, well, these are parts of me that are awful. I'm going to get rid of them. You know, I'm going to, you know, it's more of an internal family systems, um, framework where you recognize these are all parts of me and they arose for a reason to protect me and as a response to something. And there's a valid reason for that. And <clears throat> the way I can heal is not through repression because, you know, as you know, what, what you pr repress persists and what you project outside of yourself um, will, will always be there, you know, if you continue this polarization. Uh, and so if you see how a, the mental system of a human heals through accepting, through integrating back in, and then again, you go back to the dream metaphor, you go back to, uh, realizing that this is all mental, all consciousness, that ultimately it all goes to one. You realize that this idea of God and Satan, um, it is a projection of things that we have been taught 
is evil or is outside of ourselves. And as long as we think there is, as long as we don't wake up to the idea that everything ultimately is one, there'll always be a hell or some other place to put the people we don't like, or always be Satan or some other person that we think is outside of us, uh, that we can blame our actions on. And then there's also going to be a God that, you know, we can't actually take, uh, take ownership for the things that we do do. Um, it's like, oh, that's God made you do that. And if you did something, you know, unaligned. So it does, it is a shifting of perception from this lower dimensional to a higher dimensional thinking from this black and white dichotomous thinking. I was thinking the other day that, you know, this is, I, my understanding is that kids develop a, you know, babies develop a two models that they have a good mother and an evil mother. Um, because it's hard for them to reconcile the fact that sometimes their mom gives them milk and does these things, but then sometimes their mom like walks by them when they're crying or, or, and so it's, it does not fit in their cognition that these can actually be one individual. Um, and so we make these models and we've made this model of, a, a good God and an evil God, and that's God and Satan. But if you understand this idealism monism that everything is ultimately one that there is a way of healing through integration and through love and that doesn't um yeah mean that you forget yourself you have to recognize where you're at and recognize where the other dissociated part of consciousness is and you don't you don't pet a traumatized dog because you understand it's not its fault because it got abused you have to protect yourself but you also don't uh you don't project evil intentions to the dog that like it is evil. It is biting you because it hates you. You realize, no, this is, this is kind of a lower level of consciousness that is just doing what it has learned to protect itself. Um, and I can keep myself safe, but I also don't need to attribute good and evil to, um, yeah, to this dog. And, and I think this is another thing that I think theists, you know, knock atheists about it's like, well, how do you, how do you account for evil? You know, because there obviously there's evil out there. Um, again, I, th I think this becomes very simple when you have this idea of well, evil doesn't come from some outside individual. It evil is just the forgetting. It's this illusion of separateness. And it's not you, that you just merge into oneness and you just give away all your money and you decohere. You know, there is a point of being an individual. It's you have one foot in both worlds where you recognize everything is one, but it's also fun and enjoyable to experience this dream, this separateness, this interaction. Um, you don't need, yeah, you don't need a Satan. You can just see you, the, the lions aren't evil. Um, you can see other people and recognize, oh, they're doing this because of how they were raised. And the idea, it's also interesting, you know, it's very, it's very easy to get worked up and to judge other people. Um, and it feels good to feel self-righteous about what's going on in this part of the world or that part of the world and to tweet about things and to, to post, because again, it, it, it helps us fill our voids and fix our wounds that, you know, we're not enough or, or we're projecting out the parts that we don't like about our, ourselves. Um, and I think it's, it's useful to be aware of what's going on, but ultimately you also have to understand, go back to Michael Levin's work, your, your cognitive light cone, what is within your sphere of influence too. So you can see, you can view things as a dream and see what's going on in Palestine and uh, Israel and say, well, tweeting about this or getting upset or, or saying that calling this person out for not doing this, that doesn't solve the problem at all, but you can see what pattern is going on there. And I can have empathy and compassion. And then I can recognize where is that pattern playing out with me and my partner and my family members and how can I solve this um, on an individual level? And this, again, going back to Michael Levin's work is, you know, it's the cell the cell doesn't, the body doesn't develop by each cell thinking, okay, I got to develop this arm and I got to develop this and I have to take care of all this stuff. Um, but there is some balance between you just do what you have to do at your level. 
Um, but you also recognize that you're a part of a bigger thing and, and, and cooperating also is what's best for the, the, um, the higher self or the, the, the one. So, yeah, I mean, I think the ethics evil, it is very easily understood, um, through idealism, monism. And I also agree with what you said about, you know, there is a, a danger. And I was thinking about this the other night about, you know, the suffering that I see with other people. Cause I also am very kind of overtaken by, and can get lost in empathy and worrying about what happens to other people, um, at the cost of myself. Um, and that's played out in different relationships. Um, it is actually all of all my suffering as well, but we've dissociated the pain and the suffering out as well, because dissociation, depression, schizophrenia, all, all these mental conditions, I believe they're not necessarily pathological. They're, they're us doing the best we can to process information, emotions, experiences that we don't yet have the capacity or the threshold to. Um, and so it is, it can be overwhelming to take that all in. And so there is a healthy reason why we dissociate and the, the key isn't to just bring it all in yourself and get lost in it. But that, that does, that is where Christ and the atonement and this mythology, whether how much was historical or not, it actually doesn't really matter. Um, it doesn't matter the least. Yeah. It is this idea that God came down as a human who then transcended time and space and, and, experienced all suffering and talked about being reborn and talked about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, you know, all of these things actually map onto science and philosophy. Um, but it's like that two dimensional, three dimensional photogrammetry. It is so hard to cognize the, the higher dimension that there's this entropy in, in mysticism and religion that somebody has an experience and then you try to tell it to other people and they do the best they can. Um, but ultimately until you experience it, you end up with things like God and Satan and, um, and you lose track of that over time. Yeah. I think we have a tragic and dangerously immature relationship with evil, um, in our society for two main reasons, many reasons, but Two of them come to my mind now, and I think they are probably the main ones. One is that um, we have turned we have turned it into a kind of virtue to not have any relationship with evil, mm -hmm. to deny the evil within ourselves, or no, no, even even better. We have turned it into a virtue to not understand evil. We think it's a very good thing to not understand evil because it means that we have no personal relationship with evil and therefore we are pure. We are afraid that uh, if we confess to understanding evil, it will taint us because it will mean that we rubbed off on evil. You cannot understand something that you have no relationship with. So by, by understanding evil, we taint ourselves. This is a very, very dangerous value system because you cannot control that which you do not understand. If you do not understand this force in nature, um, you are at its mercy. You have no defense against it. You will succumb to it indirectly or directly through the evil that you repress in yourself. And I am not one of those like the scholastic philosophers in the 13th century who used to say that evil is not a force. Evil is the absence of good. Like darkness is not a thing. It's the absence of light. When you shine a light onto darkness, darkness doesn't resist the light. It just gets illuminated. So it's not a thing. It's not a force. It's not an agency. I do not agree with that. I think, because I do have a relationship with evil and I'm proud of it, um, 
I could be more proud of it if my relationship was more extensive. I understand certain evils, but some I, I don't yet. I don't take that as a badge of honor. I, I take that as a weakness, as something for me to solve in the future. But I do think, based on the limited relationship I have with it, that evil is an active force. It's not just the absence of something. It is one of the archetypes of mind. Uh, it, it's the opposite polarity of good. It's like a guitar string. When it's playing a note, it goes up and goes down, goes up and down. If it's never down, it can go up because it doesn't have the elastic energy and potential that will swing it to the other side. So um, I don't take evil to be something meek and unreal. I take it to be a, a, a force of its own, something active. Um, and I think it is tragic that we raise to the level of a virtue to not understand that force because it's active and for us to manage it we need to understand it you know it's it's like going to war without understanding your opponent will you win probably not that's why no army goes to war without intelligence gathering first you need to understand what you're going to resist or what you're going to fight against and but we have this extremely dangerous value system in our society that tells us it's more honorable to have no understanding of evil so we don't get tainted by it what you don't understand you don't see and what you don't see comes back to bite you in the butt when you least expect because you are not monitoring it you're not trying to understand it what I try to do and I'm just one person, and I'm, there are many other people like me, but uh, uh, by and large in our society, I don't see this happening in large scales, is I try to nurture my relationship with whatever evil is in me. Um, and I do it not by repressing it, because, you know, you cannot repress an inherent force of nature. Evil is there. It's happening all the time. To say that it's artificial, uh, is ridiculous. It's obviously natural, you know, uh, because it's happening all the time. Um, so instead of repressing it, I try to recognize it, to look at the evil in me and say, you are there, I see you, you are part of me. Not only that, you are a valid part of me. You have the right to exist, but I am not going to to set you loose. You are going to have your time under the sun, under adult supervision. You, you see, do you, do you do graph the tone I'm trying to convey to you? Um, I don't disinherit it. I don't tell it that it shouldn't exist. Because the moment I do that, I repress it and I lose it from sight and one day it will come back to bite me. That's what happens with religious people who think they are very virtuous because they have no relationship with evil. So they repress and ignore all the evil in them and they have very righteous, righteous lives until one day when they are 40, they pick up a rifle, rifle, they go to a shopping mall and kill a dozen people. That's what happens. I don't want that to happen to me. And t t today, with I'm, I'm almost 50 years old now, it cannot happen to me anymore. I, I, past the, the dangerous uh, phase. Uh, I've seen too much now about me uh, to, to fall for that, but um, it is important, and I think that's the mature attitude, to not only see the evil in you, but to not disinherit it, to not look at it and say, I don't like you and you should not be here. I want to kill you. I want you to go into exile. I want you to have nothing to do with me because that's how you strengthen it. That's how you, you become blind to it. That's how you feed it with energy. It's the energy of neglect, the energy of disrespect. That's how the evil feels. If you disinherit it, it feels it has been, it, it has suffered an injustice. Um, it, it, it's like a kid that you beat up and then you kick out of the house. That kid grows up and comes back to take revenge. Um, so I don't even do that. I don't even disinherit it. I say, no, no, you, you, I, you're still even loved. You're part of me. You're authentic. You're part of the whole that we are. We are all together in this. You have the right to exist. What I will not do is to allow you to go berserk without adult supervision. 
I'll give you your time under the sun with adult supervision, meaning I'll let you express yourself so long as you don't harm me or anybody else. Mm-hmm. And there yeah. are many ways to do that. Buy a, a, a punching bag, for instance, and let your evil lose on the punching bag. Or play a violent video game as an adult when that video game is not still rewiring your brain in a way that you think killing somebody else is an abstract virtual move and then you go and kill somebody else for real. No, as an adult, play a violent video game. Or if you're angry, I, I do that. Uh, I, 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 I build electronic stuff. I design and build my own computers back on my workbench back there. Uh, and uh, sometimes electronics doesn't cooperate and I get frustrated. And I know exactly on my workbench where the, the steel bar underneath the, the wooden top is. So, so I, I punch it exactly where I know the steel bar is because I know it's not going to break. <laughs> but I, make it, I try to make it a practice every time I feel angry to not censure myself, to not be ashamed of it, to not disinherit it, to not tell my anger that it should not exist. No, I am angry. That's how I'm going to feel now. But instead of going and punching my neighbor, I'm going to punch the dust bag or my, or, or my desk or some other way. Mm-hmm. Or if you have evil of a sexual nature, there is all kinds of plays that you can have without hurting yourself and without hurting somebody else. And then you will not go and rape someone or, or, or do something serious. Um, that's, that's what I try to do. Yeah, and I see this um, a lot in... You know, I think getting, deconstructing it, getting down to where it started, where it started to become dissociated or projected out from you uh, is the key. You know, see, there's a lot of things in Mormonism that, you know, that have come into the news, both um, Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, you know, having visions and killing their kids and stuff and a lot of people killing their spouses. and, And you see that or child, child abuse, sex abuse. And I think many of these come from small, understandable things. You know, Mormonism has a prohibition on masturbation and pornography and, and, you know, at a very low level, just normal, healthy sexuality. And there's a big emphasis on like having kids and like, you need to be a mother and a father and then you need to love it and whatnot. So you, you develop these small, healthy feelings and then you feel no this is a sin you know i shouldn't do this and then you get in this spiral where it becomes you repress and then it persists and then what do you do to um, alleviate the psychological stress of that well you go to your addiction which has become the thing that's causing it and so these healthy things spiral into unhealthy things and and you you feel guilty because sometimes you don't like being a parent and instead of saying like that's okay and this is a normal feeling you start to suppress it and then eventually someday for some people it ends up being they claim some vision that tells them that their kids have evil spirits or whatnot so i think yeah getting at the root cause and i also like again michael levin's work on cancer i think this is a profound metaphor you know where he's showing that cancer it's not more aggressive. It's not any different than the other cells. It has a different definition of self. It's closed off its gap junctions where it uh, shares the ions and shares information with all the other cells. So the minute it thinks it's separate and the minute um, we in it medicine its own way. yeah, treat it separate, you know, our, our solution is to try to kill it um, and eradicate, eliminate. And that's obviously not working with the cancer rates. And so Instead, if we can learn how to reintegrate it back in and say, hey, uh, you're actually part of this whole body that you need to be taking care of rather than just your little clump of cells here, it, it can take what it's doing um, and it can work for the whole instead of. So, yeah, I think that integration and not suppression and, and understanding and keeping it within uh, yourself rather than dissociating it and projecting it out. Is, is key. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an adult relationship uh, with evil. Um, by and large, our society has a childish relationship with evil. It's the child that thinks in this black and white terms and rushes to conclusions. As an adult, you got to recognize that evil is in you just as it is in the rest of nature. 
and it is a part of nature like everything else it deserves to exist what it what you cannot do with it is to let it run amok and lose without adult supervision if we understand that i i think a lot of problems uh, would be solved and also there's another thing we mistake we mistake um sadism for evil sadism is not anywhere near as dangerous as evil um sadism is evil too but it's not the sum total of evil far from it sadism is personal it's small scale it's localized very small and personal uh, it's the enjoyment of somebody else's suffering but you need to be in the presence of that other person to sort of feel the suffering and enjoy it even sadism which is something it's one of the evils i never found any I, I i can't relate to it but uh, i'm not proud of not being able to relate to it i think it's immature i think i should find some trace of sadism within me in order to understand it but I, i can't there are two things i can't understand sadism and child sexuality it's too and i'm not proud of not understanding it i think we should all try to understand it but um whatever it is from a first person perspective which i don't know sadism is always local and personal um so the damage it does is limited in a certain way i mean the suffering of one person should be avoided um but sadism doesn't do evil at industrial scales evil at industrial scales is abstract it's putin hitler stalin uh king yong Um, in, uh, in North Korea, uh, and that happens when the evil complex tells itself that it's doing the right thing and just paying the necessary price for it. Hitler thought he was doing the right thing for the German peoples, who were subjected subjected to unimaginable suffering after the end of the First World War. They didn't have coal because the French took all the coal for themselves. So they were they, they were cold in the winter. They were starving. Inflation was a thousand percent a day. So if you got your salary in the morning, if you waited to buy your bread in the afternoon, well, too bad. It's already worth nothing. Imagine people living like that for two decades. And um, Hitler took that as as an injustice done to himself. And he, because of tremendously pathological ego inflation he saw him as the embodiment of the german peoples so that he sent millions to die including germans was the necessary price to pay for the greater good this is true evil mm -hmm. it's the evil that abstracts from the raw reality of individual human suffering of the individual human life abstracts that away as some kind of necessary price for a greater abstract good Stalin did it, Hitler did it, Putin is doing it right now. He thinks he's saving the Slavic peoples right now. How does he save the Slavic peoples? By killing the Slavic peoples and subjecting them to horrendous suffering. That is evil and it's not sadistic. I don't think Putin would ever slice a child open. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't do that. Yeah, But he's think... capable of much worse. Yeah, this will be my... Last thought, and then I'll let you give your final thoughts and let you go. But I, I think, you know, I've listened to a lot of Sam Harris. Um, and while I disagree with where he ultimately goes, you know, kind of on a metaphysical perspective, I think I've really enjoyed his just kind of deconstruction of evil. And it's it's been interesting, you know, seeing these people leave maybe Mormonism going from theism and then going into this maybe more atheist perspective and many of them are very angry and judgmental of the people that like you know these leaders of the church or these people you know they're they're evil joseph smith etc um but it's interesting because th those individuals that don't believe in like a, a soul or some uh yeah some plan of like choosing good and evil they still when we're judging and and thinking of somebody as evil 
we're still under some sort of delusion that if our consciousness somehow magically had appeared in Hitler or Stalin or whoever we're judging and had those genetics and had whatever childhood traumas had happened, um, that somehow we would have done something differently. You know, this is the idea of like situationists and dis dispositionists. Situationists, people people do what they do because they're in the situation they are, because they have the genetics, the trauma, what whatever. Or dispositionists, people do what they do, good or evil, because there's some inner magical disposition. Um, and so until we can realize and see like, yes, the things these people do are horrible or, or and recognize that suffering, without going a step further and saying like, oh, I would never do that. And, and I am better because I am this way and see what I do in my life without taking a step back and realizing, well, if I had whether, whatever genetics, whatever traumatic, because maybe it's easier to, to justify and see, oh, somebody killed these people because they had a tumor pressing on their amygdala, yet somehow it's different that somebody grew up being abused, sexually abused as a child even though it's still creating a physical um, confirmation in their brain of uh, supposedly this, this mo brain that is causing their actions. So until we can really step in and say, yes, I see what that's doing and, and I, that's horrible. And yet I don't have any place to say that I would do anything different and keep that humility as well. I mean, that's, I think that's the key is having that humility while also recognizing what we see as optimal and loving and bringing that evil, integrating it in, understanding it, um, and then choosing to go back to the dream. You know, if everything is a dream or if that's a good perspective, it's ultimately there's no meaning outside. Monism means that you have to deal with nihilism. There's, there's no meaning outside of the one. There's no rules. There's no set of book that something outside of the one is going to, to give you. And so, yeah, that means you have to deal with nihilism. There's no inherent meaning. And then recognize that you, some part of yourself, your identity could actually be viewed as the one. And then you as a collective conscious identity with all these other dissociative parts, you collectively get to, to pick your meaning and, uh, and integrating with the other, and then other parts, you know, look at what has caused you joy, happiness in your life and its connection with others, connection with nature. You know, those, are, that's your ethics. That's your guidebook. Um, ultimately it's a dream and you get to choose whether it's a, a good dream or a nightmare. You know, it's, I think it's empowering. I, I, I agree with you at, at the level of the one meaning comes from the inside and not the outside, but that's still compatible with the statement that there is inherent meaning because to inherit mm -hmm. yep. is to be fundamentally coming from the inside as seemingly separate individuals. I don't think that the postmodernist notion that we create our own meaning, I don't think that works because it's well, not as an individual. I think it's yeah, not as an individual, yeah, as the whole, collectively. the meaning sort of irradiates out of you because of what you are. Um, but as seemingly separate individuals, I do think there is there is a meaning that does not depend on our fantasies and our theories and our stories. But uh, the point you raised earlier, this naive idea that we think that if we were in somebody else's shoes, if we had been put together the way they did, if we had had the life they had, we would still act differently. This is very naive. We would have done exactly what they did um, because that's what happened. It's you looking behind their eyes. It's mm -hmm. not another consciousness. So, but why do we stick to this naivete? I think it's because we have a equally uh, immature understanding of our uh, law and, and justice system as depending on some fundamental free will and responsibility that is independent of circumstances. We think that if we don't believe that, if we acknowledge that uh, if somebody has 
I don't know, a glioblastoma pressing into the amygdala that that caused the crime. If we acknowledge that, then our justice system falls apart. That's the story. And I think it is fundamentally wrong. Nothing would fall apart at all. The reason we think it would fall apart is that we mistake the justice system for a revenge system. Mm -hmm. to, to talk of revenge, you have to believe that if you were in the shoes of somebody else, you would have acted differently. If you don't believe that, if you thought if I were in their shoes, had had the life they had, had the genetics they had, I acknowledge I would have done the same, then there is no one to take revenge on. There's nothing to take revenge on. It's like taking revenge on the tornado that destroyed your house. It's a force of nature. Mm -hmm. Circumstances were such that it happened. And that's all there is, there is to it. You don't sue the American government in order to take revenge on, on the tornado that destroyed your village. For the same reason, the justice system, if in, in so far as we think it's based on revenge, which particularly in the US it is, um, then it would disappear because there would be no revenge anymore. The problem is that it's not about revenge. Um, in the Netherlands, and I'm not a D Dutch chauvinist, I was not even born in the Netherlands, um, but I recognize some things in every country that are positive and could serve as a good example. Now, this example happens to come from my country. The Dutch uh, justice system has absolutely nothing to do with revenge. So we don't have those sentence hearings in which the judge hears the anger and lament of the victims of the crime, you know, which is all based on this notion that the revenge has to be proportional to the suffering that has been inflicted. So the, the, the criminal has to be inflicted, comparable level of suffering. That's revenge-based thinking. In the Netherlands, the justice system is based on two ideas. One, deterrence. Two, management. Deterrence is the following. Even if you have the predisposition to commit a certain crime because of your genetics or your uh, physiological health, like tumor suppressing on the amygdala or whatever else, and, 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 and your past and, and so on, even if you're predisposed by all that to commit a certain crime, if you know that there will be undesired consequences for that crime, that knowledge can stop you from committing that crime. And this is very plausible because imagine if you would tell everybody tomorrow, whatever you do, it will go unpunished. Do you think crime would not increase? Of course it would increase. Um, so uh, 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 deterrence acts as a extra input variable into this deterministic system. It doesn't change your predispositions. You are still predisposed to do whatever it is that you are predisposed to do, but there is an extra variable that comes into your computations now. And despite those predispositions, you, you may now compute a different action because you don't want the undesired consequence. So that's half of the justice system. You get a jail sentence that is calculated to be proper deterrence. And it's longer if the crime is more serious because more serious crimes are the, one you, you, the ones you really want to deter and the ones that are less serious, you may be more tolerant and manage them in a different way. Now, after you've served your sentence, you are not released just like that in the Netherlands. Now you go and you undergo an examination by a board of psychiatrists. And now the psychiatrist will determine best way they can what is the probability that if you go back to society, you will commit a crime again? So that's a psychological and psychiatric assessment. If the board of psychiatrists decide that you still constitute a risk of committing the crime, they will keep you in a, in, in a dedicated psychiatric institution. You cannot leave unsupervised. It, 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 depending on your risk profile, they allow you to spend the days outside and sleep there at night, or they allow you just to go visit your family in, on holidays, or they put a, a, a positional detector on your ankle you know, to know where you are, they, or they keep you locked in at all times if you constitute a very serious risk. There was a famous case a few years ago somebody had served his entire sentence for rape 
but the psychiatrists were saying, if he goes out, he'll rape again. So the guy was locked into this, what we call TBS facility. Uh, and one day he escaped and he committed a rape and murder within the first 24 hours uh, of having escaped. So for as long as you're considered to be a risk for society, you are kept in, in order that other people don't suffer. It's not because the system's trying to take revenge on you. Mm -hmm. No, they are treating you like you treat uh, a pathology. Like uh, you are not to be blamed. We're not locking you up because they're taking revenge on you. No, we are keeping you here because you constitute a danger to others. And we have to protect others from that danger, even if it costs you your freedom. And we are sorry about it. You were born the way you were born. Mm -hmm. um, and there is nothing anybody can do to change that. And uh, people in TBS, they are not treated as as people who could act otherwise. They are even treated with a degree of compassion. It's not a prison. It's a psychiatric institution. And, and But it, there is a recognition that even though they are not ultimately responsible for their inherent tendencies, um, they constitute a danger to society, so they have to be managed. So you see, nowhere in everything I said, there is an appeal to vengeance or to an eye for an eye, or to retribution. It's all about deterrence and management. So even if you drop the fantasy that if only it were your consciousness in them, you would have acted differently, totally delusory, because mm -hmm. it was your consciousness <laughs> behind yeah. their eyes. And they still did what they did. Even if you drop this naive notion that... Um, you have absolute free will despite your history and your genetics and how you're put together. Even if you drop that, the justice system is preserved. It's intact. The justice system is not inconsistent with a scientific understanding of what's going on. You can still have a justice, justice system based on deterrence and management and compassion without any trace of revenge or you know, uh, an eye for an eye and none of those childish ideas that, 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 that's children's justice, you know, uh, uh, an eye for an eye is, is, a, is, a, is a children, child, childish notion of compensation as if your suffering as a victim would, would be any less because the other guy also suffered. Uh, yeah. You may think it would be the case, but if you actually got that, and you were an adult, you'd realize that it doesn't make it any easier. You were still raped, you were still beaten, you still lost your loved one. None of that, none of the suffering of the perpetrator will take away your suffering. It may temporarily think like it did uh, because of your narrative making, but uh, long term, it will not. So yeah, we, we have a long way to go in maturing uh, as a culture. Yeah, thank you so much for... Um coming on. I appreciate it. And, uh, maybe we can Thanks for talk some me. other appreciate time. We'll, we can get into entropy, uh, but I appreciate the work you're doing and taking the time to come on. Sure. It's been my pleasure. Uh...